When I was first starting this, I kind of came across two different ways that you can start identifying plants, basically, or start to identify things to forage. Um, and the, the first one is you just learn the things that are edible. And the second one is that you learn kind of all things. You, you start to build up a bigger picture of, of, of an ecosystem than just, just the things you could eat and the things that are poisonous. Um, after a little bit of research and thinking about the direction I kind of wanted to go in, I realized that I wasn't in a rush to learn foraging and that I was more interested in building up a holistic picture of, of the ecosystem that I live in over a much longer period of my life. Um, and now I've only been foraging for about a year and a half. Um, and this is a quick disclaimer, like I'm quite new to a lot of this. Um, certainly not a master, but I wanted to just, I thought it might be helpful to run some people through how I kind of initially started teaching myself um, a lot of these things and, and which things I could forage. But I decided that when I was gonna go out to when I was going out on the, with, the, with the dog or on walks and things like that, I was going to start building up a much broader picture of, of, of the woodland or the, or the coastal areas. So I was gaining an understanding of the interactions between beings and how they all related to one another in an ecosystem, rather than just specifically focusing on the ones you could eat. Bird watching was a huge part of, of um, still is a huge part of my life, but I mean, bird watching as a kid was like a big, big part of it for me. So I really learned the process of identifying things through being like a, a bird watching fanatic, basically. And, and now I've reached a point with birds where I know I've looked at birds enough times to know what things aren't. I, I know what to expect in certain places. And yeah, there's, there's always anom anomalies and it's good to research things and to look things up. But I've reached a point now where I can quite quickly get a glimpse of a, a, glimpse of a bird and know whether it was a long-tailed tit or a pied wagtail, although they look fairly similar to some people, you know pretty much instantly by the way they fly and the way um, the environments that they're in so I wanted to translate that to, um, to plants as well. And I thought if I just learned the ones that I could eat and didn't also learn the ones, that, like all, all the rest of it and the trees and everything, then I was probably doing myself a disservice in the long run because I wouldn't know what things aren't. I know what to, now I, I'm starting to build up, build up a bigger picture of what to expect where. Like I said, I wanna play the long game with this. It's not about rushing to be able to like fill up a bowl full of forage food in one day. Maybe when I'm 50, I'll be able to go out into the woods and know loads of different things to forage and loads of different ways to consume my environment. There's just no point in rushing that process. I'll get there when I get there and it will become an intuitive experience, I think, um, if I go slowly with patience. And it started with books, so I'll, I'll, get, some, I'll get some books. So the books I got were, um, they're just standard, like, identification books. I think these are, uh, co these are Collins ones. Uh, I'll get trees and I'll get flowers there. But I've got insects, birds, mushrooms and toadstools, and flowers and trees. And then this other one's good as well, which is kind of a bit of classic forager's book. Food, food for Free by Richard Maybe. So these are, this represents almost the two different directions that you, can, that you can go. This is like a foraging book, um, which, which is just telling you about how you can kind of use them in recipes and which ones you can eat. And then this one is just an identification guide. Um, and this is the direction I went down mainly. I would take that with me and start looking um, just, I would just find a plant and, and literally just flick through till I found it. Um, and when I first started getting into this a year or so ago, I didn't have a smartphone. So I was really reliant on, I was really reliant on books um, because I couldn't, I couldn't really take photos or very like 
very kind of low quality photos. I couldn't um, really research things wherever I was. So I was quite, quite kind of bound by the books in some way. Um, and I think that really, that's really helped me in the long run because now I use these as like probably my main reference point. Um, and I uh, often keep them in the car and things like that. So I think they're worth having. Um, but I think realistically, the, the very, very first place I started was probably YouTube videos. Um, and I think that, I think YouTube's a good place to start. I mean, I'm 25. I grown up watching YouTube, my main source of, um, education pretty much with YouTube. I've taught myself a lot of things from YouTube and my, my go-to when I want to learn is probably to, to end up on YouTube. Um, so start doing a bit of YouTube uh, research like you probably are by clicking on this video about the people who forage in your area and take it from there. Um, like I said, I didn't have a smartphone when I first started, but now I do have a smartphone. Um, I found that actually a really helpful way of, of foraging and learning what's around at the moment is by finding foragers on Instagram or YouTube in your local area and seeing about what they're sharing on their stories, seeing what, they're, what they've most recently posted, that's gonna give you an indication of the things that are coming out right now. So instead of like maybe just going into the woods with, with, with a book like that and being like, where, where do I start? You can just sit down, pick a plant and flick through the book till you, till you think you found it. That's quite a fun process. Um, but you could also say, go onto a forager's Instagram account that you know lives in the kind of the area you live in, click on their recent posts, click on their story, see what they were foraging today. And you go, oh, that's probably come out. And they've probably given the name, they've probably told you what it is. And then you go, oh, right, I'm gonna go and look for that thing. Then you can find that thing in the book. And then um, because you've got the name and then you can use that to go and reference um, the thing you found in, in um, out on your walk. So with that, I think that's it I want to talk about in here. Um, yeah, I think um, the, the patience is a big part of it. This is not, uh, for me at least, is not a survival experience. I do this because I enjoy deepening my relationship with, the, with my environment. Um, and I want to be in communication with all the different, all the different beings that, that live around me and eventually to be able to kind of consume them and to be able to share them with my, my, my friends and family and then to be able to pass on that knowledge. Um, but right now I'm trying to almost playing catch up on thousands of generations worth of human knowledge about foraging from books and YouTube videos and Instagram stories and stuff, you know, and uh, you just don't need to rush that. It can be, it can be a lot of anxiety about eating things that are wild and, and that's for, for pretty good reason. So if you don't feel like you want to want to be eating stuff straight away and that brings up loads of fear, then just, just, just go and go out and pretend that you're, that that's what you're doing it for. You're going to just, it's still an interaction, whether you put it in your mouth or not, that, that deepening of your relationship with the, with the natural world and your local environments still is, you're still in communication whether you're consuming it or not. You're still touching it. You're still maybe smelling it. You're still, you're still engaging in a relationship with that being, with that plant. Uh, and you might find you build the confidence up that in five years time you go, I know that that thing is that thing. I'm so million percent. I've seen it in so many different environments. I've seen it in so many different seasons throughout the year. I just know that's say a stingy nettle. A lot of people, a stingy nettle is a really good place to start because we all grow up knowing what it is because it stings us. Um, and now I know when something's a stinging nettle, it's like, it's clear as day. But there's other things that I forage where I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm like 90% sure that's what that is. Maybe even 100% sure, but I haven't seen it, like I've not familiarized myself with it that much. So I don't need to, I don't need to push it to eat it. It's not like a, it's not a contest who can eat the most things from the woods. It's just, um, yeah building the relationship bit by bit, so slowly, slowly, so that eventually you'd be able to put it in your mouth and you'd be able to eat it and enjoy it and not have any anxiety around it. And you would have probably had years of communication with that being 
um, for many for, for for before you even put it in your mouth. So yeah, don't rush. This is just an, this is meant to be just. Well, it's not meant to be anything. <laughs> it's um. Yeah, yeah. Everything about foraging and and identifying the life and the beings in my environment is a an antidote or a or, or the opposite of how maybe a lot of the rest of our culture um, goes about things with competition and with trying to continually become the best um, and everything is about turning your time into money um, it's everything's about the purpose of it this is I mean, it's kind of a, this, this is not that for me. It's kind of a purposeless activity um, in, in one sense. It's like, I'm not, I don't need to beat myself. I don't need to progress. I don't, yeah, there's nowhere to go with this. This is just like going out, chatting to plants, <laughs> um, familiarizing yourself with your home. Anyway, I've chatted a lot now. I'm going to go for a walk. The dog, oh, he's looked at me now. Should we go for a walk, Ernest? Are you ready? <laughs> he's so ready. He's born ready. There wouldn't, there's not a moment in the day where he's not ready to go on the walk that we've been on a thousand times before. That's what I love about having him. He's like, we're going to go on the walk again? The one we did yesterday? The same one we've done every day for years? Count me in. <laughs> yeah, it's happening. I'm, we're going we're gonna to go now. Let me just finish this. Come on. The tide is rushing in very fast. Whoa, that's so beautiful. Red shank. Don't know if you can see that. Little red shank whipping around in the morning winter sun. To me, isn't really about self-sufficiency. It's one arm of a much bigger web of this kind of rewilding process maybe you know that takes into account food and and movement and community and all of it so you know this kind of self-sufficient approach where i have to learn everything really fast to eat isn't really my style right now and um i totally understand if that's some people's um if that's some people's thing that's totally cool uh so for me i'm, I'm taking that uh, more Kind of holistic approach so if that's what you're interested in then that's what this rest of this video is going to be about how you go from like not really knowing anything to forage to like building up a bigger picture of of the things you might be able to start to forage and the reason that's the approach i'm taking is because nothing exists in isolation people don't exist in isolation Plants don't exist in isolation. Things aren't singular things. Ernest. <laughs> that was close. That was really close, man. <laughs> yeah, things aren't singular things, are they? If, if all the things around me, all the beings around me, rely on all the other beings around me, and they wouldn't be there without each other, then they're not... They're not really separate beings, are they? Like I need my heart to, I need my heart for the rest of my body to work. We could, because there's kind of a boundary around my heart and you could cut it out of me and go, that's a heart. Um, it, it kind of appears to us as like, as a part of a whole, but I couldn't exist without my heart. One way of describing me is made, is, is made up of parts. I've got legs and I've got arms and and, and hearts and lungs, well, one heart, ideally, um, and, all my other, and all my other bits, and I, and I need these bits to survive. And 
because that's all encapsulated in my this one kind of skin suit we're quite comfortable saying that that's one thing i'm a human <laughs> this is one object but as soon as there's gaps of space between things Ernest, stop knocking my tripod bro i don't want that stick right now i don't want it right now i don't we'll play some sticks in a second give me a few minutes Yeah, because there's what we call space between me and the plants here, and we gaps of air, I'd say, it appears to be that we're not a singular entity. But there's so many things that humans rely on plants for. Of course, food, but and shelter, and medicine, and everything. And we couldn't exist without food. So because I can't exist without the food. That's similar to saying that I can't exist without my heart. It's not within the, the suit of my skin, but the food is still something that I require to survive. So another way of saying that wouldn't be, it's me, Seth, and, and, um, and food over there as two separate objects. You could call it one object if you wanted to. You know, like flowers and, flowers and bees, for example. Bees need the flowers, and the flowers need the bees. They're separated by gaps of space and air, so we, within our, our understanding of language and the way we look at the world, we call them two separate organisms, but they need each other to exist. So you could also call them one organism. You're gonna bark at me about this stick. I'm almost ready for sticks, almost. Two minutes, take it away. So that's why I'm interested in building up this bigger picture um, because or the way humans interact with, with the earth and with other beings on the earth doesn't need to just be for what, like how they sustain you. It doesn't just have to be for, oh, that provides me food. That's an edible one. Therefore that's valuable to me. And none of the other ones are. There is, there is inherent value in all of it. Um, and you will gain a clearer understanding of, of the things you can eat by building up the bigger picture. And let me show you what I mean by that. Um, we'll do that in the next bit. So this is an example of what I meant by gaining a bigger picture of, of the environment. Um, right now, as you scan an environment, you're not looking at the, the tiny things. Uh, you might not know exactly what the things are to forage. They might be hiding behind something. So you have to maybe look for clues as to where things grow. And trees are really good clues as to where things grow. Now you might not specifically be able to eat that tree or anything on that tree. Sometimes you can. But if you know the tree as a signpost to where other things are, then it, then it narrows down the search. Of course, you're walking through an environment like this. The trees are the big thing as they stand out, don't they? That, that's the stuff that you're like, the, the, the central pillars of, of these ecosystems. And if you can identify the trees and you know what things hang out near different trees, yeah, then it's gonna, you can then, yeah, you use that as your reference point. So right, I'm standing here right now. We've got a few trees around. We've got some, some sycamore trees and we've got some elder trees. And elder trees are, obviously you can eat the elderberries and the, and the flowers and stuff in the summer. Um, but at this time of year, they don't have any of that on. But, Throughout the year, there's a type of fungus that grows on an elder tree. And it pretty much exclusively grows on, grows, grows on an elder tree. So knowing that the elder tree is there is gonna help me go like, well, I might know where that fungus is. So I'm looking around, I go along. I can't, now I've found the elder tree, I'm now gonna be able to look a little bit closer. And here we are. On dead or dying elder trees, you find these little funguses, little edible funguses and um, they're called jelly ears. Let me get the camera, I'll show you them. So the, these little crusty numbers right here are like dried up jelly ears. They don't have much moisture in them right now. When they rain, they get, it gets much, much bigger. Um, and you can, you can eat these, you can put them in, in soups, you can dry them. I think they're quite a lot used in, um, in, uh, in Asia for cooking. 
they don't have a super good texture to just eat, but you can just fry them up. So although elder trees in, in the middle of winter aren't something that I, that I want to be eating, knowing that it's an elder tree points me in the direction of this. So nothing exists in isolation. Things live off each other. Things, things exist in, in communities with one another. Um, so just knowing that that's a jelly ear doesn't help me unless I know where to find it. So this is an example of what I meant by using Instagram and um, the, the people's kind of daily uploads and recent uploads of the things they're foraging as a reference to know what could be foraging and what could be around in your area. Um, and this plant here is one of the ones I learned, I learned in that way. Um, there's a guy I follow on Instagram who um, kind of lives like, he doesn't live super near me, but he lives like in a similar kind of environment. And um, he's called Forage for Knowledge. He's really good. I love his channel. Um, and he, last spring, he posted this video. It's a video about Herb Robert. And I hadn't really heard of Herb Robert before because that was right at the beginning of a lot of things I was foraging. And um, because I was following him and I, I saw that he posted the Herb Robert video, I was like, oh, Herb Robert's probably out where I am. So it gave me a bit of a reference point to go, to kind of narrow down my search a little bit. So this here is, is Herb Robert, and it's kind of, it's kind of smells quite, I think it smells like something between petrol and coriander. Um, I'll, I'll put some close up. And it's, uh, you can kind of drink it in teas or put it on food and stuff like that uh, as a bit of a coriander replacement. It's got quite a lot of medicinal properties as well. Good for colds and coughs and stuff like that. And, um, and, yeah, that video really, really helped me, yeah, whittle down that search. That's what it looks like. And at this time of year, it doesn't have flowers, but in the summer and the spring, it has little pink flowers to make it really easy to tell what it is. But now you kind of have to know what it is just based on the leaf shape, because um, we're in the middle of winter. But I think it smells really, really good. Uh, so yeah, that's just how Instagram and maybe some more modern tech can help you. I like using the combo of the old tech and the modern tech. The, the books, the books are a great like solid foundation of understanding of identifying plants. And then things like, things like your phone and watching what other people are up to are an amazing gift to see, to see how other people are doing things um, at a different place in the world at the same time you're foraging. It's quite, kind of magic, just magic business, isn't it? Magic old business, <laughs> this thing. Um, yeah, that's that. This is a plant worth knowing. <laughs> They're all worth knowing, aren't they, I suppose? This could be an example of how you'd look it up in a book. I brought my book with me. Uh, British Wildflowers, Bosch. Um, and if you have no reference point at all, then you just start flicking through the book, and it's quite fun, basically. Um, just start flicking. I guess, see how it's got these yellow petals? You could use that as a bit of a reference point. You could flick through to your eyes, catch on something yellow, maybe. <laughs> I'm gonna just flick. By the way, I, I know what it is, I'm doing this, I'm doing this in jest. This is, uh, this is playing a character now. Man reads book. Um, right, so look, that's a wild tulip there. See that? Wild tulip. The yellow is super similar. Um, I'm gonna look, look at wild tulip and see what it says. It says they're pretty rare. It says on the location map that you don't get many of them and you don't get any of them where I am. So the location map's a real good one to, to, to tell where things are. I don't know how accurate they are realistically because um, I mean, pollen fl floats around in the air a lot of the time. Well, I don't know if all of it does, but the, the location maps are a rough estimate, estimation of where things are. Um, I mean, it says the flowers are three to four centimeters across when open. That's not the size of these. These are like one centimeter across. So they're the kind of things you want to look at. 
you want to look at when when the flower comes out right now it's just february today um and this says it uh, that the flowers come out in may and june so you can look at location you can look at time you can look at size these are all ways of kind of identifying what what things are what i'm going to keep flicking because i was i'm aware that in the because it's the summer the, the, the wild tulip comes out in the summer and um and the flowers were too small so i'm going to keep keep looking getting me really excited for all the things that are going to come out soon. I'm looking at things that I haven't, haven't seen since last summer. It's an exciting time, isn't it? It's all about to pop again. Um, and I'm going to get serious, serious hay fever. <laughs> this book is a reminder of how bad my hay fever gets. <whistles> Ooh, what was that one? We're getting closer, I think. The size of these yellow petals is... Um, we're in the uh, in the pea family now, so you can see there. That those are starting to look closer to what what we've got what we've got here. Keep flicking. Right. Those those yellow petals before looked very similar and they were in the pea family and a few a few a few p pages along i've landed on something that looks very very similar um but there's a few things that it could be so this is the this is the uh page i've landed on and you can see that these things are looking fairly similar to to what we've got here <laughs> but there's a few different types This is a spi super spiky bush with yellow, yellow petals. And I need to work out which one it is. So, gorse. I think it's gorse, but I could actually be wrong. Gorse, evergreen shrub, which means that you've, it's, it's uh, green all, all, win all winter, um, with straight, straight grooved spines, 15 to 25 millimeters long, found on heaths and grassy places, mainly in acidic soils, Flowers are two centimeters long, like we said before. Um, bright yellow, coconut-scented uh, flowers, and you get the, the the flowers come out January to December, but mainly Feb to May. So that would be right. The flowers have come out at the right time. <laughs> they they got it right. This book, um, and they're widespread and common. That's gorse, and you can you can eat the flowers but they just smell super good. They like smell coconutty. You can put them in tea and things. Give the books a go. Um, you don't have to eat anything you don't want to eat. <laughs> Remember that, it's not, it's not a competition who can eat the most wild food. If you don't feel like you want to eat it and you're not 100% sure, don't eat it. Um, it's, yeah, there's, there's no pressure here. It's just about learning and like sm smelling is a, like I said, is a way of communicating. You're getting the microbiome, you're getting the sense, you're getting the, the signals that the plant is sending out and building up that interaction. It doesn't have to be in your system. It doesn't have to be in your body. It is your body. It's all around you right now. It smells delicious. Gorse. Let me show you what the flowers look like. Oh. See, with these spikes, spiky, spiky bush. 15 to 25 centimeter long spines yellow flowers. There's a few different types of gorse, but I'm pretty sure this is just gorse. Um, yeah, beautiful stuff. Right, let's carry on. I think humans really learn things well in stories. Um, I'm gonna turn my phone off.
Well, there, there it is. There's, there goes my phone. Um, humans, yeah, I think humans really learn in the in the form of stories. I think you can really remember things easily when you hear them not in fact-based learning but in story-based learning. And a lot of the plants that I've remembered and still remember to this day are ones that I've learned by researching the folklore around plants. And when you assign kind of a, 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 an anecdote to things and you see how things have fit into human communities before in stories and how they're used for medicine and, and who used them and when they use them, all those things really just add to the, this bigger picture of how humans and plants have interacted for forever. Um, and I find that learning process really helpful. So rather than researching, like just looking at the, the, the books for identification, just get into looking at stories, just read, read folklore on the internet. It doesn't even have to be true a lot of the time. The things that you eat, well, obviously, if something's poisonous or something, that has to be true. But sometimes the story is more important than the truth because it helps you to remember it. A lot, a lot of the folklore is kind of is, is made up or is old wives' tales or any of it. Um, but maybe that doesn't matter. Maybe it's, it's, the, it's the vessel that the, that, that the plant... The plant carries itself through the story, through myth. It communicates through myth. Um... Maybe the plants have maybe the plants have some kind of intelligence that they don't specifically can like this sycamore tree for example maybe can't specifically speak English but maybe oh it's slippy I'm gonna sit down but maybe um, maybe it's smarter than that maybe the sycamore tree one of its ancient cousins can influence one person cruising through the woods and then they create a story about it and then it reminds people through generations what a sycamore tree is um, and I like to think that that's the way that the plants engage with human languages and human community that's a really big stick that's a super big stick man I'm pretty sure these are primrose flowers there's no sorry primrose leaves there's no um there's no flowers yet. I need to, I'm going to wait for the flowers to come out, come out to be 100% sure. Oh, I could look in the book even. But one of the things that I remember primroses for is that I think, um, I think taking primrose flowers is uh, technically illegal. <laughs> it's one of those weird like old English, English laws, I think. Um, I'm going to find primrose. P. Yeah, I, I heard once that that picking primrose leaves or flowers is illegal because they all belong to the queen or something. Something mad like that. I think there's something about swans that's like that as well. Like you can't eat a swan or you can't kill a swan or because the queen owns them. And sturgeons, primroses, swans and sturgeons. The, uh, the monarchy's got them down. There's some really funny names of plants. You start to realise how mad some names are. Patrick's cabbage. Alpine pearlwort. Dark mullein. There's some excellent ones. Wow, I'm really struggling to find this primrose. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P, Q, R. So it's right at the end. Ah, here we go. 132. Primrose. Yeah, I'm pretty sure this is a primrose flower. Primrose leaf. 
Familiar herbaceous perennial. Great plant words, aren't they? Familiar herbaceous perennial. Found in hedgerows, woodlands, shady meadows. Um, flowers, two to three centimeters across. Five lobed. I don't know about that. Oh, sorry, that's the flower. The flower is two to three centimeters across and five lobed, that's right. Um, and the leaf oval, oval tapering crinkly up to 12 centimeters long. They form a basal rosette, widespread and common throughout. Pretty sure that that's what that is. And I remember there being lots of primroses through here last year. So that's how like, also that like, that cyclical nature of it as well is, uh, you go, oh, I'm pretty sure that was there last year. No, that wouldn't be a good enough reason to eat it. So much of the understanding comes before putting it in my mouth. Um, but you can eat primrose leaves, I'm pretty sure. I'm not going to eat it right now. I don't feel confident enough to do that today. Maybe by the, when, when all the flowers start coming out again, I'll start eating them. Um, but yeah, stories. That are, whether whether the, the story of the, it's illegal to pick primroses is even true, that story helps me remember them. So I love stuff like that. Stories, it's all about stories. Okay then. You know, the other thing is you probably know way more than you think. You know, I, I get the impression that most people have heard of a few different plant types or, or trees or something. Like we've all probably heard of an oak tree, you know. Maybe we've heard of a stinging nettle or a dandelion. You know, stinging nettles and dandelions, like if you just know those two, you are away. There is, stinging nettles and dandelions are everything. From a medicinal point of view, you know, this isn't about finding rare stuff. Months, some of the most magical stuff to eat um, is, is the most common. And yeah, I wouldn't, probably give yourself a bit more, a bit more credit. Just learn the things you already know. If you, if you know, if you've heard the name nettle, stinging nettle, dandelion, oak tree, sycamore tree. I don't know what that one is. Um, but whatever they are, just research the ones you already know. And just get really familiar with that. You know, like dock leaves or, hi. Yeah. The language of plants and foraging and our ecosystem is probably a lot more ingrained in you than you realize. And um, often the most famous things are famous for a reason or the most common things are common for a reason. Maybe it's that the most, you know, often the most medicinal things aren't the rarest things. They're the, they are the most common. And maybe that's the earth or the intelligence of the plants being like here. Have it in abundance, have the things you need in abundance. Dandelions, you know, the medicinal properties of dandelions, cancer curing, amongst other things that I can't remember now. But we see dandelions as like a weed. And I guess in the context of a farm, and maybe the context of a, of a garden, they are a weed. So something can be a weed in one person's environment and not a weed in another. Um, but dandelions are unreal. So yeah, the inf a, lot, a lot of the knowledge is probably in you, probably a lot of the wisdom's in you. Seek that out. If you know what stinging nettle is, just do research, like folklore about stinging nettles. Get super, I started at stinging nettles because I knew exactly what they were, because they sting me, you know? They sting me. I'm really excited for more stinging nettles to come out. Stinging nettle tea. You know, teas are another good place to start with foraging without having to like look for things to eat and sustain yourself, just make cups of tea in the woods. That's pretty good. What a day, hey? Another one, another day. <laughs> it's another day, Ernest. We're having another one right now. You can teach down. Yeah, there are complicated things to learn in the world and there are maybe quite complicated plants to learn, but 
foraging and having an understanding of your ecosystem doesn't need to be gate kept information this is this is human knowledge this is human wisdom in the public in the public space not reserved for scientists and biologists or esoteric spiritual boys <laughs> um, this is for everyone so if you know dandelions and nettles or oak trees or whatever it is um, you can you can teach that to people and it will really help consolidate your own learnings yeah you don't need to be a master this is you know communicating with your ecosystem learning to forage having an understanding of what beings live around you it's like it's like music it's like music is for, for everyone it's deep human stuff um, as soon as we start talking about plants and animals and stuff like that we have we remember our kind of biology lessons and think that it has to be reserved for that you don't have to use any of the the terminology or any of the you know you don't even have to know the names of things realistically not for yourself the names of things are only for the sake of communication with others you could have just as much engagement with the with the natural world maybe if maybe even more even if you didn't know the actual names of the things in the language that you speak because the names are irrelevant the relationships are the important bit the names of things are only important in the in the context of of uh, conversation and communicating with other people so i go like oh do you know that beech tree over there and someone else goes oh yeah i know what you mean by that beech tree over there but the beech tree isn't a beech tree well, the beech tree doesn't know it's a beech tree or even maybe it doesn't even know where it ends and other things begins um so you don't even need to get hung up on the words share this this is this is information to share and to spread back into humanity um and teaching can really help learn yourself no can, can teaching can really help yeah help you remember these things yourself not only are you interacting with it but it's interacting with you it might be sharing something with you. It might be sharing wisdom with you. It might be sharing love with you. It might be sharing food with you or medicine with you. Or it might just be, give you something to lean up against, like a nice tree to sit on. I think expressing gratitude for these beings is really part of the, the, the foraging experience and that, and that rewilding experience. Because it's a reminder that we're not alone here, that, that we live in a give and take relationship with these things, with these beautiful things. Um, and then of course, yeah, and to not take too much, just take enough for yourself or for your friends and some family. But that gratitude I think is super important. And it doesn't, you don't have to have to like go up to a tree and say thank you. Again, like we, like we just talked about, the words are less important than the feelings. You know, you can go up to a tree and just say thank you. That's one way. And I enjoy that. I enjoy that very much. But you can just feel it. You can just think it. You can just be in a state of gratitude for the tree. You don't need to let the the words become more important than the feelings, you know. I experience love from things that don't speak English. I experience love from my dog. I experience love from trees. I really love from the, from the places that I walk. They don't need to say it to me, like, I love you. But I experience love there. And, um, yeah, you don't need to get hung up on the words. You can just be in that state if you want. I don't know. <laughs> I find it makes it all so much more fun if if the world is something to be in, like infinitely interacted with. It makes me feel like the world is an engaging, communicating place and what I consider me to be extends far out past the boundary of my skin. And I find that really beautiful and it adds a lot to the whole joy of being alive. 
But there we are. If I head through here. Can I do that? Oh, is that gonna fit? I'll bring this down. Boop. It's quite tight in here. Probably wasn't the best place to pick. But these here. Let me grab one. Oh, the penny worts again. The wall penny worts, navel work. Oh. And um Oh, there's a spider in that one. Beautiful spider. Anyway, Pennywort. I'm going to talk about maybe using iPhones and taking photos. You don't always want to carry the books around with you. I don't always have the books with me. In fact, I very rarely have the books with me. There's, I keep them in the car or I keep them at home. And um, you can use the modern tech to kind of help you out. You can take photos of things and then reference off the internet or off books when you get home and um, this is how I would do that. There's, I'm in a bad spot here. I'm in a bad spot. <laughs> there we are, that's better. Wall penny work or navel work. <laughs> they have like a kind of a belly button shape to them, hence the name navel work. And uh, I, eat these quite, I eat these quite a lot. I keep talking about these because they're one of the things that's around to forage at the moment. And there's not lots and lots of things. I'm sure there's many more things to forage than I know about, but this is one of the ones I know, so I'll keep talking about it. <laughs> so taking photos of plants. Snap away at the top and at the bottom. The underside is worth taking a photo of as well. Take photo of all angles. Get the idea of the size, where it's growing, things like that. And then you can take that photo home and cross-reference it off the internet or off books. Um, and then there's also apps. Um, to ID plants, which I've heard are pretty good, but I don't really do that. I really, really wouldn't recommend using any apps to eat anything, to forage anything. I always use a few sources of, of information before I eat something, like three sources. I verify it from a YouTube video, from, um, from a book, from the internet. Th there's like so many, so many ways that you could work out what a plant is. Never just take one source. And I think apps give an illusion that, that you know what something is, where there's, there's lookalikes for things uh, that can be super poisonous that you really don't want to be eating. So apps might help you identify something and get you in the right ballpark. Um, and if you're not interested in eating the plant, then maybe you can use them. But if you're at all interested in eating them, I would, I would either not use it at all or use it alongside a few other reference points um, and yeah, just that cross-referencing is something I always do. Don't rely on one source. And then finally, probably the best way is to learn from other people. Find f local forager foragers in your area and learn hands-on. That to me has been the most beneficial thing, learning from people who really know what they're talking about. And you can go at different times through the, through the year. You could do like a spring one and a summer one and an autumn one and, and build up a bigger knowledge that way. Um, but you can, you can delegate that authority to someone else to teach you who just knows so much more about it. And you don't have to take that leap. You know, there's a, there's a level of fear when it comes to eating something for the first time. Like I've eaten these a lot, but the very first time you eat them, you're like, man, was that the right thing? Was that really what that was? Even if you're hundred percent sure and you've cross-referenced it a few times, there's always that like, well, here we go. I'm going to try it. See, see, see that it's a thing. When you forage with someone who really knows what they're talking about, you're eating it with them. They know, they know what's going on and you, you put that faith in them. So find someone that, that you trust who's reputable and, and go and learn from them. Um, I, think, I think that's everything for this video. That's how I kind of have helped myself to, to, to talk myself to forage. So it's books, it's the internet, it's YouTube videos, it's social media, cross-referencing, foraging guides, stories and folklore. Um, and I think above all else, patience. This is, it's a big old world learning about an ecosystem. There's a lot there, an infinite amount. It can go infinitely deep. We could just study this one patch of rock probably for the rest of my life if we wanted to. Um, and you're never gonna know it all. So, how, so I, I find it helpful to just have, have the patience with it and remind yourself that like, it's a lot of information to learn, or it's a lot of, lot of it's thousands of years of, inf of, of wisdom to learn in a short amount of time. Um, and don't, don't push it too hard. 
Enjoy the process of it. Enjoy the com communication. Foraging can just look like hanging out with plants as well and just smelling them and saying hello and things like that. So yeah, cheers guys.